Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to build on Julia Lane's claims that it's all about people. It's good people you hire, good students you get, good editors, good reviewers, good colleagues, friends ultimately also. And what we ultimately would like to do is to connect them, to connect them globally. Yesterday you saw a network of Facebook friendships. Here is a network of scientific collaborations. This is rendered based on Scopus Elsevier data. And in order to have a more complete network, I think you also want to add the Web of Science data, you want to add Cielo data, you want to add a lot more Asian data. Ultimately, you might also like to see what areas of knowledge we have so far and how they all interlink. This is one of the so-called science maps. And I was wondering how many of you have seen a map of science before, a map that has continents that are disciplines of science, that has countries that are subdisciplines of science. How many of you have seen those maps before? I have. All right, so this is spreading. So you might see in the entrance of the conference that there are now um, some maps of science on display. There are many more rolled up in a tube, so you will be able to see them later, I believe. And what these maps of science try to do is to communicate not only the structure of science, but also trends and dynamics in science. Here you have a very special map which was created by Johann Bollen and some of his collaborators. And they use download activity data, how people download one PDF file then go to the next PDF file to download it, to the next PDF file to download it, etc. And these linkages are then used to bunch up those areas of science that are do downloaded together. If you look at science maps that are not based on the number of publications or the number of citations, but on the number of download activity, like this one here, you will see how science gets used. And you will see that many um, papers, for instance, are downloaded in the biomedical sciences by doctors which want to cure that child in front of them, which want these parents to go home with their child, not without the child. They are using this free open data and knowledge to help cure. And in many cases, they do not publish or cite other papers. All they want to do is to save that life. And I think it's important to look at these maps more closely because I think that gets us not only to output but also to outcomes. I don't have much time to talk about the maps here, but I would be happy to guide you through a tour of the maps on display outside in the afternoon, in the coffee break in the afternoon. Some of the maps also try to capture delays in the science system. Here you have information aggregated by the Council for Chemical Research, trying to understand how long, how many years do you need for foundational research, for invention discovery, for uh, technology commercialization, and how do different types of funding loops reinforce a positive feedback cycle that then funds more and more research. This Mapping Science exhibit is now in its ninth year, so we are not a teenager yet like Cielo is, but we are still having a cute, very nice um, child um, at hand, and we have um, added every year 10 new maps, and all these maps can be explored online. So if you would like to explore more of these, go to scimaps.org to zoom into them and see all the details and read the stories that come with them. Ultimately, I believe we all want to understand science not only from above, but we want to also zoom into science. So we have developed a number of interactive displays where you have here, for instance, a map of the world on the left-hand side and a map of science on the right-hand side. These are large panel displays. And you have a touch panel which you can use to select any area on the map of the world, let's say Brazil, and it will highlight for you in the map of the sciences what kind of research is conducted. So you get an expertise profile for that specific region, for that specific country, or even down to the personal level. S similarly, you can also enter your own name. And if you happen to have a 
paper in Medline, in this particular case, this is driven by Medline data, um, then you will see yourself in both maps, on the map of the world and also on the map of sciences. And some of us have very interesting career trajectories in both of those maps. Some areas are very interdisciplinary, such as obesity, for instance, or um, HIV. And so here you would have to hold down many, many uh, fingers in order to delineate the domain. And so we have implemented also buttons, also buttons for Nobel laureates, as um, you see here, um, Eleanor Ostrom, which won the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2009. So you get to see the impact of um, single individuals in both maps. The exhibit travels well in trains, so if you have a train station, this is a great way to bring a lot of science and science maps which show the structure and dynamics of science from above to a very, very large audience. You have to make sure that people which enter the train in the front kind of make it in a continuous stream to the back so that there is no kind of bottleneck inside of your train, so it has to be all equally interesting, exciting. If you would like to know more about the maps, or if you want to have them close to you displayed in a public library, at the National Academies, at your institution, we have a number of ambassadors around the globe which have local copies of these maps and can be contacted for events like this one, for instance. I think it has opened many people's eyes for the beauty and, and value of science and technology. In my talk, I wanted to give you a brief overview of the landscape of research networking services in the U.S. It's, it's a very U.S.-centric um, part. And then go, go to, over to Vivo, which is one of the uh, research networking systems that I'm more familiar with, and that we um, helped um, add uh, different visualizations that answer when, where, what, and with whom questions using temporal, topical, um, geospatial, and network analysis. And then if there's time, I will provide an outlook on how to scale all this. How many of you have a LinkedIn profile? Can I see arms again? All right, quite a number, good. Um, what about ResearchGate? Anyone? So I really have one, so that's why I'm holding my arm up, all right. So as of um, August, they claim to have 2.3 million scientists. You might have seen that uh, LinkedIn claims 225 million. These are all user profiles. These are profiles of people. Um, what about academia? Anyone? Okay. Google Scholar. All right. How many of you have more than five profiles? All right. More than 10. Wow, some are really persistent. More than 15. Okay, all right, good. So keeping one of those profiles in order is actually quite time consuming, even though in some cases it's, it's meant to be easy. But if you go into details, it really becomes actually more interesting. And to be honest, there are 60 more systems which um, Holly Falkosneski recently added to Wikipedia. So if you want to pick your favorite, you might like to go to that Wikipedia page and just browse through them. And it's interesting for me to understand which one I should spend my time with, because ultimately these systems are extremely useful for networking, for um, keeping abreast of what my colleagues are doing. But what I don't want to do is to spend my time updating regularly 10 different profiles. What I want is one, and a useful one, that actually prints my CV whenever I need a new grant proposal, that connects to my annual faculty summary report whenever I need to submit it at the end of the year, that has a lot of stuff that I need as a researcher. And obviously, we also want all kinds of um, search support and um, mining support, etc. And so in the U.S., um, there's a major effort, mostly uh, driven by funding agencies, to get one system or to get a set of systems that are very compatible with each other, so that if you move from one institution to another one, you can take your profile with you from one and ingest it into the other, and you're good to go again. And um, this is mostly driven by biomedical research, because this is where much of the funding is. 
Um, but in the direct-to-expert system, for instance, you see many, many institutions have bought into it, and most of them either use Cyval experts, use um, the Harvard profile system, or use the Vivo system. And unfortunately, I don't have much time to introduce those three systems in detail, but um, I wanted to give you some updates on what they do differently from LinkedIn and ResearchGate and Academia you just saw. Um, so Vivo, um, I think it's interesting to see that it's an institution-based repository that connects to high-quality institutional databases such as sponsored research databases, um, human resource databases, and also course credit databases. So it's not just publication you would have about me, but you would also know what I teach, what kind of funding I get, and it's all a unique identifier because I'm getting paid by IU. And therefore, all that data that has touched money is much higher quality than any of the publication data I have seen so far. Um, it also recently um, starts to pull data from Activity Insight, which um, is a um, system that many, many universities in the U.S. use to do those annual reports for faculty. Harvard Profiles recently started to support open social. So you can now take a visualization in Harvard Profile and plug it into a different um, researcher networking system. It's like, just like Google Gadgets. So I think having these systems be porous so that you can easily ingest a lot of data from different sources, but also plug and play different um, services, if you wish, is important. Um, Boston University also recently developed a tool to create ORCID IDs for their faculty. So just like you go to the IT department to get a user ID when you start at a university, whenever you publish your first paper, you should go to the library and get your ORCID ID and then use that to publish your first paper. Um, Cyval Experts by Elsevier also has a number of really interesting features that will increase the utility of those systems for users. And ultimately, it's not the number of profiles you have in these systems, but it is the number of active users that really use these systems on a daily basis and help improve that data. I wanted to point out that in the U.S. we also have the um, Science Experts Network Curriculum Vitam. So this is a new emerging standard for rendering scientific uh, resumes in a format that then can be exchanged across these different platforms. We have been watching the evolution and um, maturation of these different systems very closely because ultimately we want to use that data, that free open data, high quality data because it has touched money to study science by scientific means and to render results in these maps of science as you have seen them in the very beginning. And so I think what you really want is um, to have open data, to have open code, to have easy harvesting and ingest of major publication data sets. And I'm looking forward to also have more and more access to um, Asian and, and Latin American data, to have inter-platform compatibility, and to also be part of federated search tools, um, support the unique X, as I would call it, unique authors, unique institutions, unique geolocations. And you need a way to make this all sustainable. So having consortia, which multiple universities uh, buy into, seems to be a good way to go. If I have a few more minutes, I would like to um, also show you what kind of visualizations we have been creating. So in many cases, um, people have a lot of data at their um, hand now. We can access publications um, globally. But what we don't really have is good tools to find our way through all such data, to find collaborators and friends, and also to identify trends. So obviously, we can rank, get rank ordered lists of um, relevant experts, of relevant papers, etc. But that's very, very different from making sense of that data. And um, however, given data mining and visualization tools available today, you can implement these. So um, the tools we have been implementing typically use temporal, geospatial, topical, and network analysis at very different levels. At the micro level, just one individual, to the meso level, an entire institute, an entire area of science, to all of science, global maps. And um, some of the examples are listed here. 
Um, as for Vivo, we um, implemented uh, temporal analysis, just the number of papers, the number of grants or dollars or citation counts over time. All these visualizations have to be readable to a very general audience, not experts. It has to be clear how to read them very quickly. And you can use the organizational hierarchy to look at all of uh, Indiana University or the major colleges or the major schools or the major departments or going down to the individual level. You can also create the science map overlays to see expertise profiles. You can compare different um, schools or departments. And Vivo is open source, so you can download it, install it, and all these visualizations come with it for free. You can also look at um, co-author and co-investigator networks, and you can browse them locally. And you can have it on your favorite um, handheld device. There's also a book now on Vivo, and um, the analysis and visualization pipelines are very well documented, so you can expand on them and add your own. You can also download this data, and then you can start rendering all kinds of different visualizations. And some of those has, have been ex incredibly useful for pulling together teams that respond to major funding opportunities, here, for instance, in disaster management. And so if you have only a month of time to pull together a team of 100 people to work on disaster management, you really need to have an infrastructure to identify all the relevant experts on campus and nearby or globally if, if the money goes um, beyond uh, country boundaries. Um, in the interest of time, let me um, go over to the last point. Um, the big question is how do you scale this up? Um, and one piece which we have been trying to do is to create something like um, Flickr or YouTube, which you might be using to share images and videos, but to create it for software, for um, data readers, algorithms that read data, algorithms that analyze and clean that data, uh, algorithms that visualize that data. And so these plug and play macroscopes, they help algorithm developers, which might be social scientists and biologists and physicists and many non-computer sciences, um, to wrap up their algorithms in plugins and then users on the other side, which might be the same domain experts or other domain experts, to benefit from all these algorithms that now exist to um, analyze um, data in new ways. And it is also important that they can construct new workflows in, in very, very uh, quick and easy ways. And so in the, in the middle, I think you still need computer scientists to build that infrastructure, but then many more people can um, use it. I also wanted to um, briefly mention that we are interested to um, update and um, this um, science classification system, the UCSD map of science. And I'm, I'm very proud that um, Abel Packer will um, join the workshop we have in November that brings together major data providers and um, bibliometricians, scientometricians to yet again update this classification system and add not only Chinese data but also Cielo data to these large scale maps of science. Okay, I think that's, I'm out of time, but thank you for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer questions.